right, the timer is done. If you want to grab your seats um, and grab your Bibles at the same time, we are going to be looking at 1 John chapter 4 today. 1 John chapter 4. And we're going to look at just um, six verses here this morning. 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 to 12. As we approach the idea of love uh, this Christmas season. It's a very famous passage, a very important passage in God's word. 1 John 4, verse 7 to verse 12. Let me read it for us here. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us. And his love is perfected in us. That's God's word for us this morning. Simple, right? Somewhat. (laughs) Let us pray. Oh Lord, today, today our focus is not to make much of us. God, it's not to make much of me but to make much of you, O Lord. Knowing that, Lord, there is coming a day where, God, we will make much of you for all eternity. What a day that will be. And so, Lord, in the time being, for even these moments that are ahead, that you would, God, show us that this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that you have loved us, and you've sent your Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Oh, Lord, speak that you would speak to us here today as your family, as your children gather, and as your word is read and preached to them. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, thank you so much. Um, Our theme over this past couple of weeks and for the rest of the month of December is the theme of Simple Christmas. That has been our theme, Simple Christmas. And by what we mean by Simple Christmas is, is that Christmas, we want Christmas to be communicated without the flashiness without the stress, without the drama, without the massive marketing campaign. I don't know how many of you are tired of that kind of Christmas. How many of you are feeling that already? Because we're, you know, we're, a, we're a week away from Christmas Eve, and already some of you are just like, oh, when is this going to be over? When is this going to be done? And what we want to do is we want to pull everything back and see Christmas as it was meant to be. And I would suggest to you this morning that what we mean by simple Christmas is actually, I don't know if you've noticed this, it's a play on words. It's a play on words. The simple Christmas that we are proposing is actually not so simple after all. It's rather far greater an idea than what this world would expect Christmas to be. See, what we mean by Christmas is not that we're making it simple per se, but rather we're actually expanding our view of Christmas, not lessening it. We're actually lessening Christmas when we make it all about us. We're lessening Christmas when we make it all about material things, the stuff, even the turkey, as good as it might be. We are actually lessening Christmas 
if it's not about God. So I would suggest to you that our, our sermon series, although entitled Simple Christmas, is actually Deeper Christmas, Fuller Christmas. Um, you'll notice the last couple of weeks, I, I've picked up on this, and I think Pastor Howie, whether he meant to or not, it's come through very clear. You've, you've, I don't know if you noticed this. He has preached the last two weeks on simple faith and simple joy. Now, I noticed a theme as we've uh, gone through these concepts of simple faith, simple joy, is that what is simple in concept is actually massive in its implications. What is simple in concept is actually massive in its implications and meanings. Uh, Let me give you an example. You notice that the, the theme or the key verse that Pastor Howie brought up for us in simple faith was this, with God, nothing is impossible. Amen. That sounds simple, but when you think about it, that is massive. That is massive in its implications, that nothing is impossible with God. Or think about last week, our theme, joy. Do you notice that Pastor Howie rested on that verse, which is probably the crowning verse, right? The angels speaking to the shepherds. These lowly, simple shepherds and saying, for unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, and get this, he is Christ the Lord. A simple statement, but with massive implications. If Christ is Lord, that means he's not just Lord of just a moment, not just of a section, but of all. That's massive and, and today, we're going to see the same thing. What we're going to look at today is simple love. Now, <laughs> I can say this with a, a kind of a chuckle, and maybe you can too as you think of it. Love seems to be anything but simple, am I right? Love seems to be anything but simple. For those of us who truly understand the concept of love, now, I understand that, you know, the feelings of love feel Simple, right? That first feeling of falling in love, or as Bambi would call it, being Twitterpated, right? <laughs> Just that initial feeling where, you know, there's the hearts and everything's flowers, roses, and daisies, you know, or maybe guys, it's when you see that awesome car and that feeling of love, right? That you feel in your gut, and that's more the smell of exhaust and burnt rubber, you know? That's what you, that's the feelings and the sights you see, right? And like, even, even that, those feelings are just rather a moment. And even by the world's standards, not even taking Christianity into account, even by the world's standards, love is gloriously breathtaking. It's heart-pounding. It's full of emotion and expression. But all the while, when we truly get into it, when we truly uncover the meaning of love, we see that love is difficult, exhausting, and sacrificial. Amen? Amen. Love, I would suggest to you today, is hard, especially in this broken world. But it is not empty. Love is hard, but it is not empty. It is not empty. I think that's why we have Christmas in the first place. Think about how the first Christmas began or how Christmas began. God calls this man, this simple man, Abraham, out of his homeland and says he will make a great nation of him in the book of Genesis. And this nation in its development, becomes this group of wanderers and exiles going through consistent upheaval and changes. We read that throughout the books of Kings and the Chronicles and throughout the prophets. And I really think that's why the nation of Israel is called Israel. When does God give that name to Jacob? When Jacob is wrestling with God. And we see that Israel, in its sense, its beginning has been up and down and up and down and all over the place. I think that's why they were called Israel, the struggle. And it's there in Israel, the nation of Israel, at a time of political, social, and religious turmoil. 
Like the Roman, Romans have come in and taken over Israel and they, they have placed this puppet king, Herod, who breathes out murderous, violent, self-centered edicts from his throne. And, and the temple is just full of these self-righteous um, people. It's there amidst the struggle of that time that the Messiah, the Savior of the world, is injected in the simplest of births, not birth in a palace, not birth to a throne, but a simple birth to the simplest of families in the simplest of places. But friends, it, it comes with it, the full force of God behind it. Like if you read the Christmas story, it is only by God's power, grace, and strength that that happened. It is only by God's power and strength that that happened. It seems so simple that she brought, Mary brought forth her firstborn son and laid him in a manger. It seems so simple, but it contains with it the full force and understanding of the God that we serve. Think, for example, holding a baby for the first time. Those of you who have had children or maybe have uh, nieces and nephews or, or friends who have handed you their newborn baby. It's, it's being handed to you and it's something so simple. This little life that you hold in your hands. What are the thoughts that run through your minds? I don't know about you, but for me, when my children were handed to me for the very first time, my thoughts were, this is so simple yet so massive. Nothing's going to be the same. This is going to change everything. This is going to change everything. And could it be that love, for all of its complexities and difficulties, is the same way? Could it be that something so simple is so massive all the same. See, true love, friends, is doctrine or faith in action. It's belief in action. It is God's greatness made known to us in practical, active ways. It is in the act of selfless, sacrificial love that God has chosen to make his greatness known through love, and we're gonna see that today. The problem that we face in our world today is that due to our sinful nature, we wanna break these things down and pull them apart. I'm sure that most of us, or all of us, would say that we want love. I'm, I'm pretty sure if we were to poll the room, a lot of people would say, I want love. I want to love, I want to be loved. But there are many who would want love without God. There are many of us who would want love without God. And there are many in the world who want love without God. And there are likely also those, although they wouldn't say it, they might live like it, who would want God, but don't want love, as the Bible would define it. Love as sacrificial, laying your life down for someone. See, it's very interesting because to have love without God is the essence of liberalism. To say that I define love as I see fit. And to have God without love is the essence of legalism. Where I have faith and relationship with God, but it does not serve other people, it serves me. It's not about me laying my life down for other people. See, to separate these two would be to empty both of their significance and power. The love that is the heart of the gospel message, and especially in the passage we are reading today, is the love that arises from faith in God. And one is incomplete without the other. Is incomplete without the other. Now, I'm not saying that people who aren't believers cannot love. In some ways, they do this better than Christians. We have seen this. I'm saying, rather, that it's the power of God in us that enables us to love the way God has loved us. To love the way God has loved us. And that is a far deeper, far greater, far more amazing love than this world 
could ever show, could ever possess, could ever contain. And so it is here yet again, just as before, in a season of difficulty and exhaustion and stress that we inject this story into our lives to remind ourselves of who God is and what he's done. And that love of God is made knowable through us and how we love each other. So, get this, to fully understand Christmas is to reflect the fullness of God's love to one another. To fully understand Christmas is to reflect the fullness of God's love to one another. Our passage this morning, our teacher for the morning, is the apostle that is best suited for the subject. This passage in 1 John was written by John, the disciple whom Jesus loved, we are told. This is the title that he was given, the disciple whom Jesus loved. Now, 1 John is a really interesting book. It's not written so much as a letter as much as it is written as a sermon. It's written as a sermon. It's almost like you can hear John preaching to people as you read this book. The book of 1 John is a book about certain, of certainty in uncertain times. He wrote it, and you'll hear him saying over and over again, that you might know that you have eternal life, that you might know that you are sons and daughters of the king, that you might know the love of God. I've written these things to you. It's a book of certainty about God, about Jesus, about light, about darkness, about relationship, about love. And John is a master at making theology practical. Now there are people, and what I mean by theology is the study or the understanding of who God is. There are people in this world who know just mind-blowing facts and knowledge about who God is and know the Bible, but they cannot apply it to their own lives. And the book of 1 Corinthians would say that is rubbish because it is without love. I love the book of 1 John because it makes theology practical. So John starts the passage today with command, and we're just going to look at three things really quickly. And it all stems from this command. Beloved, let us love one another. So anytime there's a command, anytime someone tells you to do something, what's the immediate thing that comes to your mind? I know what comes to my children's mind when I say clean your room, right? The answer is, why? Why? I'm just going to mess it up later. What, why, how? Any command begs these questions. And this is where John gives us the answer. Let us first look at the source of love, and that is God himself. Verses seven and eight, we're just gonna break it down every two verses. Verses seven and eight, whereas in other places, John commands people to love. Throughout the book of 1 John, he commands them to love several times. He, here, he commands them for a different reason. Whereas before, he commanded people to love because Christ commanded it, or it was evidence of walking in the light of Christ. Now he pulls back a deeper layer, and I would say it's the deepest layer of love yet. He says this, let us love one another, for love is from God. Love is connected to God himself. He is the source Love is connected to a person. Love's origin is from God. It did not originate with us. Love was not man's idea. Love was God's idea. It originated with God. There's a place in John 17 where Jesus says, when he's speaking to his father, we get Jesus' high priestly prayer to his father before his crucifixion. He says, thank you, father, that you loved me before the creation of the world. That you loved me before the creation of the world. So love existed long before this world existed. It's not something that God created when he created the world. Love is, originates from God. Think of the implications about that. If love originated from God, who is the author of love? Seems simple enough, but we don't live like it, right? God, then, is the one who has full sovereignty, full power to define what love is and what it is not. 
what it is and what it is not. God defines what love is is and God defines then what love is not you see the massiveness of this now contrast this with how we steal God's word from him to make it suit us how often we use the term love I loved that oh I love that person oh, I love those socks now I'm not again I'm if you use that word around me, I'm not going to be like, oh, repent, you know. I, I'm not going to come after you. I, I use that word. I already did in our sermon. I don't know if you noticed in saying those things. Love is a way of us expressing care and thought towards those things. But I want us today to go deeper than just our mere simple semantical ways of using love. And I want us to see love for what it truly is who originated it, see the massive implications of it, and maybe it might cost, cause us to use the word more and with more power and with more strength because we know that it does not come from us, it comes from God. You know, how often in our world we want to fit God into our definition of love? Think about that for a moment. How often would we rather read the words in verse 8, anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. How many times we would rather say, well, love is God. Well, love is love because God says what it is and what it isn't. God has full control, full sovereignty over what it means to be loving. He is the authority. It is who God is. It is his essence to be loving, it says. Even in verse 8, God is love. That is huge. And how God communicates himself to us, one of the ways we can know that is through love. But so often we want God to submit to love rather than love submitting to God. And it is when we begin to understand the greatness of God that that makes love so much more amazing. It's far beyond our definition and even our desires of love. God is love. Think of the implications of this. That means that God in his love is not loving at some times and other times not. It means that God is always loving. God is always loving. That means in his truth, he is loving. In his grace, he is loving. In his wisdom, he is loving. Even in his judgments, God is love. Now think about that for a moment. Um, how many of you parents have denied your children something <laughs> because you love them? How many times have we said, no, you cannot have that or you cannot do that because that will hurt someone else. Or I'm, because I love you enough to tell you the truth. I love you enough to tell you that that's not right. See, that's, that's real love and that's real sacrifice because it's not about you saying to that kid, I'm, you can do whatever you want. See, saying to someone, you can do whatever you want and just going with it is really not loving, is it? It's really not loving. If we love people, we want what is best for him, them. And if God truly knows what is best for us, it is loving that he directs us in such ways. It is loving that he directs us in such ways. God is love. Love is the evidence or byproduct also of God's work in us. Look at verse 7. It says this, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Now, what it's not saying here is that love is what makes, if you love other people, that's what makes you a Christian. Because there are plenty of people who would not believe in God who can love. Rather, what it is saying is love is the effect of what God has done in us. Through faith in God, through faith in what Jesus Christ has done for us, we now experience new life, and that new life is loving. When we understand that, it is loving. 
And through faith in God, we now enter into relationship with God. And throughout that relationship, we become more and more loving. Love is the effect, not the cause of these. Faith is the cause, love the result. And lack of love reveals lack of life and relationship with God. This is hard. Lack of love. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. Lack of love reveals lack of life and relationship with God. Even going back to 1 Corinthians 13, I mentioned it already. The Apostle Paul says, if I have faith that can move mountains, but I have not love, I am nothing. If I have faith that can move mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. Faith shows itself by love, love for God, love for people. And then the question comes, well, okay, if love is from God and we are to love one another in representing God, how then should we love? What is love? Baby, don't hurt me, don't hurt me, no more. Sorry, that just came to mind and I just, I've been, anyways, um, I'll stop there. <clears throat> the act of love. We've seen the source of love is God himself and now we, we, it is possible that we have new life. It is possible that we have relationship with God because of the act of love and what we've seen in love and that love is from Jesus Christ. The second point here, the act of love is Jesus. Look at verses nine and 10 with me. God's love injected and shown and revealed in this. Notice he says it twice, once in verse 9 and once at the beginning of verse 10. In this. This is how Jesus is God's love manifested to us. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us that God sent his only son into the world. The greatest, most visible power or picture of love is God sending his son to us? Is God sending his son for us that we might live through him and that he might die for us? Now, an, un an aspect of understanding God's love for us is to consider the love between the father and the son. You know, oftentimes, like I could go on forever and ever and, and try to help you grasp the magnitude of God's love for you. And that's, I want to do that continually. However, there's an aspect that we often don't think of, and that is the love between the Father and the Son. Notice that in these verses, we get a representation of God's love within himself as the Trinity, as the community of the deity, of God himself. An aspect of understanding God's love for us is to consider the love between the Father and the Son. First of all, the Father loves the Son. The Father loves the Son. He loves us so much that he sent, notice it says, his only Son. His only Son. Now what that means, that word means, it's, it, it's referring to unique. One of a kind. God loves so much. What's that famous verse, John 3, 16? For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Now think about it. If God didn't, God the Father didn't care much of God the Son, would his love be all that strong? Would his love be all that strong if he was just like, oh yeah, go do that. But no, God commends his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Think about the love that the Father has for his only son. That he would send his son to die. Friends, this is massive. There's a connection there, that he sent his only son. The love between them, if it was not strong, would not amount to anything significant. What makes God's love for us so powerful is that it's his love for his son. When we get that, when we understand how much God the Father loves his son, that he would send his most prized possession, his most prized person to the cross. How many of you could do that? 
Many of you would say, oh, I couldn't do that because I love my son or I love my daughter, or I love my child way too much. God loves his son so much. And then look also here at how the son loves the father. We get this inferred or implied to us. God sent his only son into the world that we might live through him. The son loves the father in that the son was perfectly obedient and going. He was perfectly obedient in going. He went. He loved his father and did his will. Remember what Jesus prays in the Garden of Gethsemane before he's about to experience the cross, not my will but yours be done, O Lord. See the love the son has for the father. The love between these two characters of the Godhead, these two persons of the Godhead. And so if God loves his son so much and if, if the son loves God the father so much, can we then begin to even just grasp even a little bit God's love for us. God sent his son, first of all, that we might live. He sent his son into the world, into this messy, sinful, chaotic world that it was, not to bring us out of the world, but that we might live in this place. And this life is connected now to God who is love. Jesus says, I have come that they may have life and life abundantly. And when we are born of God, our lives are no longer for ourselves. It is connected to God, the sovereign Lord, the most holy one, connected to him in relationship, born of him. Elsewhere, John says in 1 John, see what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called the children of God. And so we are. And so we are. God sent his son that we might live. And then secondly, God sent his son that he might die. In this is love. In verse 10, such a powerful verse. In this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. And that word propitiation means payment. That he would be the payment for our sins. That he would take on the punishment, the cost for our sins. Notice, it says, this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that he loved us. God is the one who initiated. God is the one who stepped out in love. Not that we have loved God. It's not because of our love for God, but rather his love for us. God first loved we didn't. And friends, this is really important for us to understand. Because this is the essence of true, godly love. Jesus says, greater love has no one than this, that a man lays down his life for his friends. And elsewhere, in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus says this, when he's preaching on the Sermon on the Mount, if you love those who love you, what good is that to you? But if you love your enemies, if you love the people who aren't loving you, that's great love. That is great love. See, so many of us in our world today, and, and Christians included, we just want so badly, we feel like it's easier for us to love those who love us. It's an exchange. But what if it's not an exchange? Christians are called to go deeper and to love the people who even don't love them in return. Because that reflects the love that God has for us. It's not that we loved God, but that he loved us. It says elsewhere, again, I've already said it, God commends his love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And Jesus became the payment for our sins, and it came at great cost to himself. He died on the cross. I love what Matt Chandler says um, about, um, about this. He says, at the cross, Jesus publicly outed me. At the cross, hanging there on the cross, he publicly outed me. 
He basically is saying, as being on the cross, God coming down in the flesh, dying on the cross, taking upon himself my sins, he is saying, when we see him on the cross, Josh can't do it himself. Josh can't do it himself. That's why I'm here. Josh has messed up so much. He has sinned so much that he cannot save himself. He can't put himself on a cross. He can't endure the wrath of God. That's why I'm here. And at the cross, friends, God publicly outed each and every one of you. He outed you. You can't do it without him. You need him desperately. And that's why he came. See, friends, this is love displayed. Love is a person, but love is also a verb. I don't know how many of you remember that song by DC Talk, Love is a Verb. Now, obviously, you're not down with the DC Talk. That's all right. Love displayed, love is a verb. I would define it like this, love is movement. John moves from us understanding love as a noun, as God is love, to a, now a verb. Love is an action, not an abstraction. And what I mean by that, love is not just purely a thought or a feeling or an affection of the thought. Love, he's, John is trying to portray or trying to get this through to us, that love is not something that just stays in our minds or in our feelings and our emotions. Love is something that is, it just spills over into our lives. Love is movement. It is real concrete faith, through faith and action. I would define love in this way, movement towards another who is distant for their welfare at great cost to yourself. Because this is what God did. He moved towards us when we created such a vast, um, distant gap between us and him through sin. God moved towards us, not to bring great cost upon us, but to bring great cost upon himself. God closed in the gap between us. See, friends, to love is to not make it about you. To love is to not make it about you. See, we think of love as a means of gratifying self. But love is, by definition, the end of gratifying self. It's the end of gratifying self. It's not thinking about you at all. But how often do we do that? How often does this world define love as love is what makes me feel good? Love is what's going to give me some sense of purpose. Love is what's... Friends, we have the greatest sense of purpose and meaning that has come to us and died on the cross for us. This is the power of God in love. His movement now moves you. And this is thirdly, the achievement of love. That is, relationship with him or being brought into his fellowship, being brought into the church. Verses 11 and 12, beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Notice the word beloved there. It's not a change of subject, but of emphasis. There's a new identity there. You are loved by someone. It's not, it's not empty that, God, that John writes to believers saying, calling them beloved. You are greatly, deeply loved. Loved by your Father. You are loved so deeply by Him. And when you understand the extent of that love, or even just grasp a glimpse of it, it changes you. There's a new identity. You're loved by someone, and not just someone, you're loved by the one person whose love matters most of all. If God so loved us, calls us to a greater level of understanding love. The infinitude of who God is and the depth of his love for you. We ought also to love. Here comes the command again. This love, when you get it, fills you to overflowing, meant to be expressed through us. And loving the way God loves us 
is the evidence, again it says, of God abiding in us, of God's life in us. That means it goes on to say in verses 13 all the way to 15, it talks, it breaks down those two uh, parts there in verse 12 where it says, no one has ever seen God if we love one another. God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. In verses 13 to 21, I didn't have time to go through it today, I wish I could have, but it just breaks down those two phrases, what it means to be living in God. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. He's given us the Holy Spirit, God's presence and power working in and through you. It gives you faith to know and trust God. Continuous, keeping, and then it goes on to say that you, are con- you have confidence for the day of judgment, knowing that you know God. And you know what he's done for you. And then it says, secondly, that his love is perfected in us. That means when we understand that God is love and what Jesus Christ has done for us on the cross and because of that, out of that, we see the sacrifice of Jesus, we then love in that same way. When we reflect the love of God towards others by sacrificing, by laying our lives down for one another, we are then achieving, we are then, God is achieving love's perfect intention through us. You're letting love then have its full intended complete effect It's what God has intended to show his greatness through his love, through laying himself down, that we might lay ourselves down. And even in weakness, the Bible says, then we can be strong. Even in weakness, to see the power of God working through love. Friends, I can only give you my own experience of this. Where yesterday, my family and I, we celebrated three years without our little girl. And the feeling of weakness, the feeling of helplessness that we've had, and how easy it would just be for us to say, no God, you've driven us off a cliff We're taking control. How easy it would be for us to just try and take control back. But in that weakness, friends, when we can say, okay, Lord, we now grasp even a measure of a cost that you felt in losing your son, in laying yourself down, When we are weak, then we are strong. And we've seen the power of God working in and through us. We've seen the power of God working through you towards us in laying yourselves down, in entering into pain and suffering. And that's why we want to do this with Vanessa, with Vivian, and with others who are hurting, with the Cormier family. We want to enter in and lay ourselves down and say, it's not about me. It's about him, the power of God poured out from God through Christ in you to others. And friends, that connects us, that connects us as the body of Christ, that connects us as family. I was thinking today, as we're singing here and we're singing these Christmas carols, we sing together as family. There are many different families represented here today, but we are all family under Christ. I have a responsibility to your children. I have a responsibility to you just as you have a responsibility to me and to my children. We are family together. See, the achievement of love is God birthing something that the church, or sorry, that the world has not seen before, and that is the church. Remember in the, the book of Acts, we, we, we looked at it years ago where where. One of the key phrases that stood out to me from the book of Acts is that these men who, who are turning the world upside down, see, that's the power of God working in the church. It turns the world upside down. How can these people who endure such suffering, such weight, such heaviness, 
How can they have this kind of an impact? How can they have that much power at work through them? The only answer is that God has chosen to make his greatness known through something so simple and so seemingly weak as love. And so we've come full circle, which is what John, how John does things, in that the greatness of God is made known by love. And friends, let me suggest to you today, if you truly want to know love, you cannot separate one from the other. You cannot separate God from love, and you cannot separate love from God. What makes the two most powerful is when they are, we understand that God is love. So the implications, beloved, are thus for us today. To see the greatness, the majesty, the overwhelmingly robust power of the living and true God and the height, the depth, and the intensity of God's love for you potently contained in this simple phrase, beloved, let us love one another and apply it to others in your life. Let your love be stronger than you so that it displays the power of God. Let your love be stronger than you so that it displays the power of God. The early church father, Jerome, tells this story in his commentary on the book of Galatians. He tells this story um, that has been known throughout the church of the apostle John when he was very, very old. When he was old and, and weak, His disciples, John's disciples, used to carry him in to their church meetings in Ephesus when he was the pastor there. They used to carry him in because he was so old, so weak, so that he could then preach to them, so that he could then minister to them, him being so old. And he was unable to say anything else to them but this. Little children, love one another. And he did this continually, day in, day out, when he met with them. Until the people who were there, his congregation, were just getting so tired, so tired of him saying the same thing over and over again, speaking the same words and asking, Master, why is it that you, they finally asked him, they've got enough courage to ask him, Master, why do you always say this? And John replied, again, very weakly with no little effort. Because, he replied, it is the Lord's command. And if this only is done, it is enough. It is the Lord's command. And if this only is done, it is enough. Now think about that for a moment. We're talking about John. The disciple who walked, talked with Jesus. John, who is called the disciple whom Jesus loved. John, who was a part of the movement of the church in growing in huge, massive ways amidst unbelievable persecution. John, the writer of various books in the New Testament. John, who was then also called later on in his life the indestructible John because the Roman Empire couldn't kill him. Like there's actually an account of them trying to boil him in pitch and him not suffering, him not dying. And they pull him out and the Roman Emperor gets so fed up with him that he exiles him to an island exiles him to an island called Patmos, and what does he do there? He writes the book of Revelation where he sees God in his power showing John the end of all things, how everything's going to play out. John has these massive visions falling on his face, seeing Jesus, seeing God, seeing all these incredible things laid before him, and at the end of his life, he sums it all up by saying, Let us love one another. For all the things that John saw and did and experienced and believed, he came back to this one simple truth. Let us 
love one another. So beloved, I say the same thing to you this morning. It sounds so simple, but yet it is so massive. Let us love one another. Friends, fathers, sons, wives, sisters, brothers, children, enemies, pastors, Christians, love one another. Let your love be strong, not in you, but in the Lord. Because God is love. And then, just as a quick side note, there are some of you here who do not know that love. There are some of you here that are desperate for love. Who think, well, it'd be easy for me to love if I really knew love. If I felt love, or you're hungry for love. I, I mean, I was a youth pastor for a while. I saw it in teenagers, right? And to be honest, it's, it might be a little bit more obvious, but it's not all that much different from adults. Friends, this is why this passage is preached, that you may know that God loved you so much. If God loved you so much that he would send his beloved son to live the life that you should have lived and die the death that you should have died so that then he could then give you of his righteousness, of his life. If God loved you that much, much. Friends, there is no other love in this world worth knowing than that love. If that's all you get in this life, if people hate you from day one to day whatever it might be for your life, you know the fullness of love for you in Jesus Christ. There's this amazing story, and if you'll give me the time, I just want to share it quickly, of the theologian Karl Barth. He was a German theologian uh, way back in the day. Um, I think it was early 1900s. And uh, he studied and wrote massive accounts of theology and doctrine and all sorts of words that I cannot pronounce. And he was once at a lecture. um, I believe it was in the United States he came over. This was pre-war era. And uh, someone once asked him, how would you sum up everything you've learned? How would you sum up the, the weight of the theology that you have studied and the expanse that, of what you have learned? And this is what he says. He thought for a moment. There was a pause. And then Karl Barth said, Jesus loves me. This I know. For the Bible tells me so. See, we sing that with our kids, something so simple, but we don't recognize the massive implications of that, friends. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. And friends, if that's what you can get through to your kids, if they can spend their entire lives expanding and and growing in this knowledge that Jesus Christ loves me, then I would say as a parent, as a disciple maker, you are doing well. And friends, is it the same for you? Jesus loves you. Do you know this? The Bible tells you so. See, the gospel is so simple that Little children can understand it, but yet it is so profound at the same time. Sometimes I think we make it more complicated than it needs to be. And I guess this is what I'm meaning by simple love. To fully understand Christmas is to fully reflect or to reflect the fullness of God's love to God and to others. And I guess the opposite could be true. To reflect the fullness of God's love is to fully understand Christmas. Christmas, friends, in wrapping things up, Christmas is a time for us to recognize fullness. I'm not talking about turkey. I'm not talking about fullness of material things, and I'm not even talking about fullness of family. Because otherwise, 
Christmas would just be for people with family. At Christmas, we see, and get this, we see that the fullness of the world, all the things this world might offer you, cannot compare to the fullness of God come in the fullness of his love and placed in a manger. It is something so simple, it's so massive. For all the difficulty in bringing about this birth, it is not for loss. Love is hard, but it is not empty. And for all of the difficulty that led this child, this baby, to the cross, you notice Jesus didn't just step out of heaven and jump onto a cross and then go back up to heaven. He was born and lived 33 years. 33 years until he died on a cross. For all the difficulty that led him to the cross, the abandonment, the insults, the beatings, the thorns, the nails, the weight of sin and the wrath of God, it is not for loss either. Love is hard, but it is not empty. This is the amazing thing of what Christ has done for us, friends. Because of God's love for you, he emptied emptiness. He emptied the grave. He emptied death of its power. He emptied sin of its power and has filled you with life. Friends, this baby changes things. It can change you when you grasp the weight of him. So friends, this Christmas, look into the manger. See who God is and what he's done and do not be the same. Let us pray. Oh God, we trust you and we love you. Thank you, God, that in this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the payment, the propitiation for our sins. Father, we love because you first loved us. How great is the love of God that is lavished upon us that we would be called children of God. That means we are no longer slaves to fear, to sin. We are no longer used and abused. We are no longer messed up. But if anyone is in Christ, new creation. The old things have passed away and behold, the new has come. And Father, it is that kind of love that changes people. It is that kind of love that makes us more loving. So Lord, would you plant that in us here today by your Holy Spirit. Give us the faith to see you high and lifted up. And God, may that just overwhelm us with love for one another. And may we go from here loving people, even the unlovable ones what the world would call unlovable ones. They are not beyond your reach. They are not beyond your love. We bless you and we love you, Jesus, in your name. Amen. Will you stand and we'll worship together the God who is love. <laughs>